Sorry for the delay. So let's get started. So just a reminder, today or this week we don't have a formal lab. It's sort of your open lab. So it's meant to be provide you extra time to collect data for your final project. And if you'd like to come into the lab, uh, you can feel free and uh, the TA should be available to help you with uh, any uh, issues you're having with collecting your data or modeling with the input, uh, doing the input model, say using the input modeling tool in Arena. Uh, but I've, uh, I think I posted on Canvas that you should check with your TA as to whether their TA is going to uh, be in a lab for that period or going to be in um, a, you know, their office hour spot. Uh, so double check with them to see where they'll be because they don't anticipate a lot of people coming to the lab. But if, um, if you do need help with uh, the lab, you know, feel free to just make sure you know where your TA is going to be. And then next week, the Lab 9, which I still haven't had a recorded video for, but the slides should be available. I didn't realize there are a couple of modules where the modules weren't published, even though everything inside them was published. And so that was the issue with that ICA that was originally due today. So um, even if Lab 9 was available, and you possibly weren't able to get to it, but you should be able to get to it. But I'm going to try to, hopefully today, if not tomorrow, uh, record the video for this one to help with that, but it should be pretty self-explanatory, but i just like to provide a little more help on how to get started with the output analyzer in uh, Arena. And then Lab 10 is kind of an advanced topics lab, which kind of includes uh, sort of almost a full second bonus lab bolted onto it that if you choose to, that you, you can complete, but you don't have to complete. So, but there's an opportunity for some extra credit there. And then after that, the two weeks left before then and when you present are going to be open periods that you can feel free to come into lab to get help with your final project or you can use that time uh, you know, outside of the lab with your group or however it works best for you. So that's our lab schedule going forward. No formal lab this week, but then uh, the next two weeks we will have normal lab schedule and these are just individual lab assignments. They're not directly related to your project and then the next spots after that are just open lab periods that you can make use of to get help with your project if you'd like. Uh, then the final project, the next big deliverable is the input modeling report, which is kind of like the lab report for the non-lab this week. And so it's a group submission, so only one person in your group needs to submit it. We formed all the groups, and so everybody is assigned to a group. Uh, this, um, you know, ideally it would be there's a sort of trade-off between giving you a little more time for the input modeling report or having you turn it in within this sort of short timeline. This short timeline is designed so that we can go through them and as quickly as possible um, take a quick read and be able to flag like, oh, this is way too ambitious, this is way too simple, um, I think you're going in the wrong direction here, this looks really good. Um, and so on. And so hopefully we can get them the, that feedback back to you so that you don't invest a lot into something that in the end you have to end up turning a different direction. So uh, that's uh, kind of the reason for this. But then likewise, let's say you look at your input models and there's like eight different things that you're thinking of input models for. I'm not expecting you to go and collect data on all of them. The input modeling report is really just meant to be sort of part one, a proposal for the project you're doing, and part two, a demonstration that you at least have put some thought into how to go out and interact with the system and gather data with the system. So even if you don't have all of the models specified, as long as you show me that you're sort of your head's in the game, then you're going to get the credit for it. And so, and then also, we're not going to check to see if whatever you said you were going to do in the input modeling uh, report is what you end up doing. So what you might end up saying is like, I really think we're going to do this system, but actually, you know, once we start working with it next week after you turn this thing in, you find out that another system was better. Well, that's fine. You can totally switch to that. It doesn't have to relate. But I at least want you to start working on your final project soon, because if, you know, if I, we didn't do something like this, then at least in years past, before we had anything like this, in some groups, and you know, not a lot, but some groups would wait until like the last week, and it's really hard to take all your data and to do all the modeling in that last week. And so you kind of want to avoid that embarrassing situation by at least getting to the point where you'll have data soon, and then after that, we'll kind of leave you alone until the project. So that's kind of the schedule going forward. There are details. It's a, it's a you know, one to two pages, a paragraph, maybe two on your system. Um, a couple of 
uh, plots showing me that your data matches some models that you fit, maybe some QQ plots, maybe some histograms, et cetera. Um, so I put four sample input modeling reports from past years online. So uh, hopefully that's helpful, but then again, feel free to send us questions if uh, you have any. So are there any questions so far on the final project stuff going forward? We feel like they have clear direction. I've met with a couple of groups you know, who wanted to hash out a couple of ideas, and that's great. Um, if you do want to, you know, send me a, if you can't, if you want to get feedback sooner than office hours, then definitely just send me a note or post a message somewhere saying, we're thinking about doing systems A or B, which one do you think is better, and I can give you my opinion. So, all right. So uh, then moving forward, uh, like I said there, that ICAH that was originally due today, that was my bad that Canvas didn't uh, release that to you. And so that is actually due in one week, but then also this other uh, ICAJ1 is due in one week. Uh, then there's two other sort of uh, you know, novel ICAs, and then the last ICA after that is the final review ICA. Homework G3 has been online. It's uh, due in about one and a half weeks, I think. And so the question one is basically takes from lectures uh, G1, G2, and G3, mainly G3, where you're going to be doing some goodness of fit. Uh, but although there is sort of a comment about input modeling that comes up here, and I referred to that in lecture G3, there's a question about when would you use, you know, when would part A apply versus part B, and output validation is, is involved in that. And then today, we'll learn about power analysis, which is what, and how to do these pair t-tests when we do these, uh, with these statistics, or stochastic simulation, and that's what we'll talk about in today's lecture. So after today's lecture, you should have all the tools you need to complete this homework and plenty of time to do it. And then after that, there's only one more homework, and it's an arena-based homework uh, based on that inventory management problem you've already seen from the past labs, that you know, the Bucky, the inventory uh, uh, evaluator. Um, so uh, that, I think, is already available. So you should, you know, if you like to, you can keep working on that. But once it's sort of a formally assigned, again, you'll have about two weeks. So that's the assignments going forward. Any questions? All right, well then let's start getting people's sort of juices flowing with a midterm-like attendance uh, question. So you can talk with your uh, neighbors on this. So here's the question. Um, so just on question one of the uh, kind of the attendance here, you can fill in your answers here. And so my, my question here is I have two blanks. I should be most suspicious of blank p-values when I have blank number of samples. And my question is, which answers are correct? And there might be more than one. So talk with your neighbor and see if you can figure out which answer or answers, and there probably are two answers at least, due to the fact that I've underlined that. Um, so which one of these is correct, you know, based on our discussion last time? And think about like, you know, the, the, the two coin example, that, you know, when you flip two coins, they both come up heads, you know, what do you uh, infer about the coin? So chat with your neighbors, and then you can fill out that as your uh, question one of your attendance exercise. And just as a clarification, when I say suspicious, I mean you can't trust them. Like I get a p-value and I'm like, I, you know, it's low or it's high, but I can't really trust it, so I'm suspicious of it. Oh, uh, no, you can just, uh, there's going to be a couple other attendance type things like this, so you can just leave it up there. If you, if you do want to submit, fine, uh, but it's easier for me if you just kind of submit them all at once. It's fine if you've already hit submit. All right, so let's bring it in. So let's have a quick chat about this. So 
How many people think, I'm just, uh, you know, without just sort of getting a, a histogram here of the distribution, so how many people think A is a correct answer? Okay, a couple. How many people think B is a correct answer? Not that many. C? Uh, a handful, so to speak. D? So a lot of people like D. All right, so um, so let's let's first look at D. So I see when I have high p values. Uh, so if I have high p values and a small number of samples, so small number of samples that already kind of tells you that maybe that's this is something to be suspicious of because if I only flip a coin twice, how much can I say? And then we already kind of know that low p values somehow are statistically interesting to us. And so I can say so D is sort of the easy answer. And I'll say that D is definitely one of the answers I was looking for, one of the answers. So, um, so that, you know, so for so just to make sure everybody's on board here. So if you have high p values, then that means that you don't have a lot of discrimination ability. So you have a null hypothesis, and there is high probability that the data that you drew comes sort of is as weird as any other data that could have come out of that null hypothesis. It's pretty typical. A high p-value means these are typical data for the hypothesis. And a small number of samples means that, you know what, and actually there's so few samples, I, I don't really have any basis of making any sort of inference. Now, we could flip to that and say low and small. And so the question here is, should I be suspicious if I have a small number of samples but a low p-value? And I actually noticed a lot of people answered this one, but this was not one of the answers that I was looking for. I actually am totally happy with low p-values and a small sample size because low p-values, regardless of how big your sample size is, means that these are data that are so weird that even though you have few of them, it would be very unlikely for them to occur with the null hypothesis. And so A, I would say, is not one of the correct answers, even though D is. So it's not just the sample size I'm looking for. So the question is then, what, are, what of these two, which one is the other correct one? And uh, so let me just take this question again. So how many people would vote for B? OK, now then how many people would vote for C? All right, so more for C. And C is actually where I would go as well. So um, this is, so the, what this here is a little strange because you say low p-values. In 380 and 385, I always thought we were looking for low p-values, p-values that are less than 0.05. And you can have low p-values. Again, all that means is that you have successfully discriminated from your null hypothesis. But if you have a huge number of samples, your ability to discriminate, your sensitivity is going to be so high that you may have detected a difference which is not actually a useful difference. So statistically speaking, D is my answer, but practically speaking, C is my answer. So what I would answer for this is, is C and D would be my answer for question one. Now these are graded for completion, not correctness, so I, you know, just be honest, and it's, it actually helps me see how you guys would answer in your attendance uh, when I go through and check all the, uh, through the, all the attendance ones. But the correct answer to me here would be C and D. Are there questions about that? Why, um, I hope, I, it looks like everybody is sort of on board with D, but I can see how C might be a little bit confusing. Any questions about that? Yeah. So just to recap on that real quick, what the reason why you would be concerned with low counts in large sample sizes is because it would be like too sensitive when you compare to other ones. That's right. Is it the, the, if you were to compare a model um, of, if, you had a, if the response variable was, say, my mood, and, the, and you had a model that included Pluto in your model and didn't include Pluto in your model, the existence of Pluto in the solar system, the model, the, there probably is some really, really tiny effect of Pluto out there in the solar system on my mood. But it probably has so little effect on my mood but if you had a model that did not include Pluto in, in it, the statistical model, then you'd do a pretty darn good job predicting my mood. So you don't need Pluto to detect my mood, but it probably has some tiny effect. And so if you had enough data on my mood, you probably could end up finding the effect of Pluto. Uh, 
And so with enough data, then you could get a p-value that would discriminate between these two hypotheses. But in the end, it's not practical. Like, who cares? Uh, because Pluto has such a small effect on my mood that I don't really care that this model is better because it's better by such a small amount. So low p-values are not always useful when you have a huge amount of data. And that's why you have to be really careful in applying these small sample statistics like t-tests when you start getting into huge amounts of data. And we'll talk, and that actually leads into the lecture today. But one more attendance question then, uh, before we get into content here. So fill in the blank. So this is just fill in a word, and this is just word recall here. Uh, a test with higher statistical blank will reject a false hypothesis with fewer samples. So it takes fewer samples to reject a false hypothesis if the test has a property that we call statistical what, what here. So you can talk to your neighbor and figure out, you know, try to remember what word we used for that. All right, let's bring it back. So, uh, so does anybody feel like they have a good, uh, a good guess of what the answer is here? The vocab we're looking for. If, uh, if it helps, the electrical engineers might say I times V. Uh, power. power, right. Statistical power. So that's what we mean by power, is that we can reject the false hypothesis with fewer samples. So, um, so yeah, so you should start using that word frequently because it will end up being, it'll, it'll often be sort of the, the, the test between you know, a, a good inference and a bad inference is whether you have enough statistical power. And so um, this should enter your vocabulary and become very familiar with you over time. All right, so, you know, just recapping from uh, last time, kind of coming off of that there. So, you know, we talked about, we reminded us that alpha is the probability of rejecting a true hypothesis. So we can write that formally as that if we're in a world where a null hypothesis is true, how often do we reject it? The other names for alpha are significance level, risk of type 1 error, or false positive rate. Now, I kind of hate these terms positive and negative because it's always very confusing, you know, what's positive and what's negative. Typically, to a statistician, what positive means is that you have detected a difference. And so that is a positive result. So you assumed the null and you successfully detected a difference from the null, and that is a positive result. That's confusing because you've almost, you know, you said you've rejected the null, so it sounds negative. But rejecting the null to a statistician is a positive result because you have detected a difference. So I, you know, I'm going to try to, be, you know, be, I, I want you to get kind of comfortable with this language, but I'm not going to use it that much because it, it is sort of confusing. But I do want you to get used to looking at, say, ANOVAs and things like that and looking for differences and looking for a difference. Finding a difference is good. And so that's why we're saying it's positive. So then the p-value, like I was just summarizing earlier, is given a set of data and a hypothesis we think are true, we say, what is the probability of the observed deviation represented by that data if that hypothesis were true. So you get some data that is kind of far from the mean, and so the question is, how often do you get data that is this far from the mean? And if you have a lot of variance, then maybe it's very possible, but if you have very little variance, and maybe it's not. So very low p-values mean that you have detected a difference because it's very, very unlikely that those data would occur if the hypothesis were true, but very high p-values just mean you haven't detected a difference. That does not mean you found support for the hypothesis. That just means, that could mean that you have very few samples. So that might mean you just do not have enough data to detect the difference.
So that's why you have to be careful. We don't like to sort hypotheses by p-values because p-values don't actually rank hypotheses because just like in the two coin flip example, if, if it comes up heads twice, I still, my priors, my Bayesian priors tell me it's probably a fair coin. But the p-values tell me it's a biased coin, it'll always come up heads. But if you only have two coin flips, you can't really say either way. So, uh, so that's alpha and the p-value. Now, the, the one that we probably aren't as comfortable with, but hopefully you will be by the time going into these homeworks, is beta, which is the probability of not rejecting a false hypothesis. Written formally, if I'm in the other world where the null is false, what's the probability of failing to reject it? So I'm in a world where I should see a difference, but I don't. So this is referred to as often as a false negative rate or a risk of type 2 error. So that we, we say this is a negative result, failing to reject. That means it's, we haven't detected a difference. And it's false because we should have detected a difference. That's why there's a false negative. Now, in the book, sometimes they'll throw in, um, instead of writing H0 is false, they'll say H1 is true. So very often, we're comparing alternative hypotheses. Again, it's like goodness of fit. And so H and then any other subscript is an alternative hypothesis. And whenever you see H1 is true, you can think they're saying the alternative is true, um, which is another way of saying we've detected a difference from the null. The null is false. So these are sort of synonyms, at least so far as, uh, as up to this point in the context. All right, so then the, the kind of the new one that nobody really talks about beta, but they talk about beta as complement the statistical power. And so statistical power is quantified as one minus beta, which is, again, in a world where the hypothesis is false, how often do we reject it? So this is the so-called true positive rate, or TPR. And so this is, it's a positive result because we've detected a difference, and we should have detected a difference, and so it's true, thus true positive rate, uh, also known as sensitivity. Sometimes people call it recall as well. And so the sensitivity of a test is synonymous with its statistical power. So if you have a lot of data, you have a lot of statistical power, you have a lot of sensitivity. And so a test power is modulated by not only the number of samples, but how variable it is. I mentioned that if your null hypothesis has a very narrow variance, and if your data set have a very narrow variance, then you maybe need fewer samples to detect a difference from the null. If you know that, like, you know, my null hypothesis is that everything comes up three and it comes up four, I only need one sample to know my null has been rejected because my null said it always comes up three and it came up four. So one sample, I can reject it. So the variability and the number of samples work together to give you statistical power. And so we're going to do a power analysis today, and there are tools for this. So if you were to Google you know, power analysis, you'll find a bunch of software tools that some of you may use on internships or in your first jobs, like you know, G-Power, for example, is one popular one. And these are tools that help you determine the statistical power of, of tests. And you know, more, uh, more directly, the, their use is how many samples you need. So you're going to go out and run a pilot study, maybe it'll be a simulation study, maybe it'll be a real study. You're going to get data, and you're going to pump it into the power analysis tool, and then the power analysis tool will come out and say, based on your pilot study, we estimate the variance in your population to be X. And consequently, you're going to need Y samples in order to make any discrimination. So that tells you how much more investment you need to do in your experiment, because the power analysis has told you how many samples you need in that experiment. So that's, and that's going to do a sample of that in this, in this lecture, and then also in your homework, you'll do a sample of this as well. Now, a power analysis can also give you the flip side of that. If you say, I only have a budget for taking 10 samples, I can only run this experiment 10 times, then it'll say, all right, based on the variance info you've given me, if you really you know, can only run this experiment 10 times, then this is the smallest difference you'll be able to reliably detect. In other words, if you get a p-value that's greater than 0.05, then the, if the difference was larger than this smallest difference, you would have been able to detect it. But if you care about differences smaller than this, 
you won't ever be able to detect them. You're always going to get p-values that are greater than 0.05. And so this tells you, again, sort of how sensitive the test is. So this is something you should try to work into your vocabulary as you move forward with this sort of stat stuff. All right, so we can summarize all of that in this so-called ROC curve, which if you take any machine learning courses in the near future, you'll probably see a lot of these. And so uh, what it was being plotted here is alpha on one axis and statistical power, or one minus beta, on the other axis. And, uh, and so what we're seeing here is these three lines are three different statistical tests. So in this particular case, this is three different machine learning uh, classifiers for a particular application. You can view them as like this is chi-squared, this is a KS test, and this is an Anderson-Darling test. And, uh, and these all are trying to detect a difference from a given distribution. And so uh, what this is showing us is as you adjust the alpha in the test, what happens to the statistical power? Now, if your test was the dumbest test in the world, just a random chance test, you could go into Excel and basically say, draw a random number and compare it to alpha. And when it comes up true, then you say, uh, oh, yeah, we, uh, we rejected the null. And when it comes up false, we say, well, we didn't reject the null. And so that has nothing to do with the data. But that would allow you to build a classifier that would fall along this line right here. So when alpha is all the way up at one, then uh, what we're saying is that we have a type one error rate or a false positive rate of 100%, which means we reject all the time. But if we bring alpha all the way down to zero, we never reject, you know, our false positive rate is zero, but so is our true positive rate. It's also down to zero. So this is kind of our benchmark. You always want your statistical test to be better than this line. And so most statistical tests look like a hump like this. And the more data you give them, the more humpy they look. And for the same amount of data, a test with more statistical power um, is going to look you know, humpier than other ones uh, given the same amount of data. And so uh, you know, if I were to sort of slice this at alpha equals 0.05 and say, I'm going to fix this at alpha equals 0.05, then I can ask, of these three tests, which one has the higher statistical power, and that's maybe this black one. And all that tells me is that I need fewer samples to make the same inferences. So this black one is kind of like the Anderson-Darling test of, uh, of, of uh, testing for distribution fit. Uh, or the Shapiro-Wilk for testing for normality. So, um, so this is at least one way to, you know, I won't get into the weeds too much here, but I want to at least be exposed to this and get this basic idea that there is a relationship between the false positive rate and the true positive rate, or in other words, between alpha and one minus beta, alpha and statistical power. And we will get more into this um, when we do the power analysis later. But you know, so but there's a trade-off. If you increase your alpha, that is a way to increase your statistical power. But the downside is you're increasing your alpha. So you, you get something for something. This is the cost of this benefit. All right. So, um, ROC curves. Any questions about that? Has anyone seen an ROC curve before in any of your courses? All right, so again, take any sort of intro to ML course, you'll probably get familiar with, uh, with, with these and, uh, and comparing different tests along these lines. All right, so, um, so let's move forward. So the, the, you know, the first estimator that we talked about last time were these point estimators for mean and variance. The big thing that I wanted to make sure everybody remembered was divide by n minus one here. Because you've already estimated the mean, then you've effectively taken away a data point. Because now knowing the mean and knowing n minus one data points necessarily means you can solve for the nth data point. And that's why this variance is calculated over n minus one variations, n minus one degrees of freedom. And that goes for regardless of if you have a continuous or discrete or kind of a histogram version, they're all dividing by this n minus one. So just a reminder, when you estimate the mean, then estimate the variance, you have to divide by n minus one. And then we said, well, so, but what if I have a distribution and I don't just care about mean and variance, I care about all these parameters that go into the distribution. Well, then what can I do then? And a simple approach is this so-called maximum likelihood approach, where you take the probability mass function or the probability density function for your distribution, and you kind of flip it around. 
Normally, these things, you give them a parameter or a set of parameters, and it gives you a distribution of outcomes. Well, now you flip it, and you give them an outcome, and it effectively gives you a distribution of parameters. And you sort of say, then, what is the most likely parameter for the outcomes that I've measured? And we did an example for the exponential, where using a little calculus, you can solve that the best parameter choice for fitting an exponential is just one over the mean delay, the mean interarrival time, if these are durations, interarrival durations, which in some ways makes a lot of sense. But I mentioned that if you look in the book that gives you a table of these things, and I've kind of given like the ones here where these expressions make sense, but all the other ones in the book are much, much more convoluted. And so just because you know the best estimate of the mean doesn't always mean that that's the best estimate of a parameter that involves the mean. So make sure that you, know, you actually look up what really is the best maximum likelihood estimator. But it just so happens that for Poisson exponential normal and log normal, they are kind of what you would expect. But that's just a coincidence. So it's helpful and convenient to look for. These blue ones are kind of the ones that we focus on mostly in this class. Uh, but I just, again, for purposes of exposure, log normal, when you get certain types of data sets, uh, will end up being one that you end up seeing a lot as you move forward with things. And then some of the other distributions from the book, again, you get a little more into the weeds, but again, they're there for a reason that not the whole world isn't really modeled by these three just in this class that we're working with. All right, so any questions about any of that stuff, about the maximum likelihood, about point estimates? Just want to make sure everybody is confident on everything from the past before we can move forward. The only other thing that we kind of covered is the modification of our goodness of fit tests for general distributions. And so we said for you guys know how to do a chi-squared, and you probably already know how to do this for 380 and 385 as well. So this should just be a reminder. But in, before the midterm, we used the chi-squared to, to test for uniformity. Now we use it to test for any distribution we would like. And so we have to adjust the expected counts to be the number of samples times the probability that we would have gotten a sample in that class, in that bin. And so for an interval, this is just the number of samples times the CDF evaluated the upper side of the interval minus the CDF times the lower side. So you get that, you get a new expected counts, and then you can otherwise apply the chi-squared exactly as you did before the midterm. The only other little hiccup is that you now need to be careful that your intervals all have more than five in their expected counts. And on Thursday, we'll actually talk about why, you know, five. You know, what, what, what exactly, what magic happens when there's five or more? Uh, but if you don't have five, you have to combine. And that's something you'll end up doing in your homework. So you'll get expected bins that will be three or two or one, and you'll have to keep combining them with adjacent bins until you get a super bin that has an expected count of five or more. Now, once you've done all of that, then you have to adjust your, your uh, degrees of freedom so that it's n minus one, where this is the number of bins, minus the number of estimated parameters. So this number of bins is after you've done this consolidation, and then this s is the number of estimated parameters. And so if you've estimated the mean of your hypothetical distribution from the data, you have to penalize your degrees of freedom. If you haven't, if I've given you the mean and I've said the mean is two, I don't care what the data are, test against two, then you don't have to penalize you. So and we talked last time about you know, where those, you know, why, what's so special about estimating parameters and how it takes away a degree of freedom. So any questions about this, any of these modifications of the chi-squared? Is this pretty clear? The big change here is you penalize your degrees of freedom by the estimated parameters, you combine bins that are too small, and you have to calculate the expected number using the probability distribution. It's not just the number divided by the total number of intervals. All right, and then the other change we made was to the KS test. And it's exactly the same as the pre-midterm KS test, but when you set up your table, instead of putting the raw data sorted in this middle row, you sort the data and then run it through its CDF. And then you put the quantiles in there instead. So you put the CDF values inside into here instead. And then otherwise, it's exactly the same KS test that you did before. 
And the advantage of this KS test is you can use it when you can't use the chi-squared test. So you can use it for small sample sizes, but you cannot use it, at least not easily, when you have estimated parameters. So if you have estimated parameters, hopefully you have a large enough sample size to use the chi-squared. Um, otherwise, you can use the KS. Any questions about this modification? Is that clear? Well, so you could apply the KS test with large amounts of data, but it ends up being uh, computationally cumbersome, and it is not something you can do when you have estimated parameters. So like on your homework, at least for one of the subsections of uh, question one, you have to estimate a parameter, and so it would be impossible for you to use the KS test without significant modification of the KS test. All right, and then the other thing but I want you to at least, we didn't show you how to use these, but you're going to see them in your statistical tools. The Anderson-Darling test, think of it as a more powerful KS test. It works just like the KS test, but you can use less data with it. Um, and so this is a tool that you're gonna see in a lot of stats programs, uh, more modern stats programs other than the KS. And then uh, you'll often have to test for normality specifically. And if you're testing for normality, then the, the specific Shapiro-Wilk test is one that you'll also find in your stats tools, and it's even more powerful, statistically powerful, than the Anderson-Darling test. And so know that it exists. I'm not going to show you how to calculate the Shapiro-Wilk statistics, but look for it if you ever have to test for normality, and you very frequently will, and we'll see that today. All right. So, and then also, when you're doing these things, like your goodness of fit tests for your, uh, your input modeling reports, or just out in the world when you're released from ASU and are you know, making a healthy paycheck, then um, people will also look for these QQ plots. And so, even though you've maybe shown that statistically, numerically, there's a good, you know, it's got good goodness of fit, that you should also show a QQ plot as a sanity check. Um, to sort of to visually show that not only do the stats say that there's a good fit here, but visually it actually does lay on a line. And so this, I would say, is not that great of a fit, but it's not too bad. So, um, so always throw in, you know, consider throwing in QQ plots and histograms along with your goodness of fit results to improve your argument. All right, any questions before we move on to new stuff? All right, so new stuff. Um, so we're now moved out of input modeling. And so, you know, this is our general outline of how stochastic sim works. We've got these probabilistic and statistical models. They go into our stochastic sim, and they come out as stochastic output data, where the randomness here is generated by the randomness here. And so we've previously been talking about garbage in, garbage out. And so how we really need to make sure we have good input models before we can trust our outputs, even if, our, the structures of our sims are good. So even if we can convince someone that this looks like the right structure, if our inputs are bad, our outputs will still be bad. So that's where we were in unit G. In this unit, we're actually focused more on the middle part here. And so we're now moving into verification and validation of what is known as V and V and the general process of calibration. And so the idea here is that verification is like debugging. Is, is my implementation correct? I wanted to model an exponential here. Did it actually get simulated as an exponential? Validation is once I'm pretty sure I have no, no bugs in my code, is, is my model structure correct? Is this actually doing what I expected to do? I know my inputs are good, but do my outputs look like real world outputs um, given the same inputs? And if they don't, then maybe the structure of my model is wrong and I need to make some changes. And then that iterative process of making changes is what we refer to as calibration. You can see that word caliber in there, and caliber means quality. And so calibration is the iterative process of improving the quality of a simulation. And so uh, the basic sort of diagram here is T, V, and V testing, validation, and verification. So it's kind of like you've built a simulated system before, even though it's a simulated system, just like any system, you build, you build a factory. It might be a simulated factory, but it's still a factory. Before you can use the factory, you have to test the factory. And so there's this process of testing we go through 
that is sort of independent of our inference about the real world. And so we have our real system, which is our reference. We have a conceptual model of the real system. So verification confirms that our simulated model looks like what's in our head. And if it doesn't, then we made a bug in how we implement it. Now, once we're confident that we have implemented it correctly, then the validation step compares the model to the real system. And it may improve the model if it doesn't match the real system. And this process of coming up with an initial model, comparing to reality, a secondary model, and so on, is what we call calibration. So that's what we're now into here, uh, just for this lecture. It's, it's T, V, and B and calibration. All right. So uh, this is just sort of summarizing the sort of stuff that I've already said here. Um, you know, for verification, it's kind of a, there's no, there's no hard science for how to get it right. It's, you know, it's just doing stupid stuff in your code and fixing it. So have somebody else look at your model. Test your output on a wide variety of input parameter changes. Make sure that your, out, your system isn't accidentally changing input parameters during runtime. Like little things like that, uh, you know, there's the, you eventually start picking up on common mistakes, but you just build this experience up over time. And you know that by programming code. It's hard to tell somebody how to fix their code. You just kind of have to do it a few times. Now validation um, is a little more systematic. We have to sort of have a, and we're going to see this in an example here, with a, a modeling a bank. We start with a system that has high what we call face validity, which just means that when you look at it, it kind of makes sense qualitatively. And then we make sure we do goodness of fit stuff on our inputs, and so that sort of validates our model assumptions. And then we have to then turn our statistics to the outputs. We compare our outputs to the real world, and then that's when finally when this comes up and it says, yeah, this looks like the real world, we can now start doing real work with our sim. And so, um, so that's what we're going to get into here. So let's start with an example. We've got a bank. Uh, let's say it's got these four tellers that people can drive up to, and we like to model operations at this bank. And so, you know, step one, build a model with high face validity. So right now, I just sort of modeled the bank as like a black box, where I've just kind of got the stuff on the outside of the bank, and I'm not really worrying about stuff on the inside of the bank. And so uh, we've got these random variables coming in, my inputs, the arrival times, the service times at each one of those, at each one of these clerks. And then I've got decision variables. How many of those are open at a time? One teller, two tellers, three tellers. These are things I optimize. Uh, what's the mean service time? Well, that doesn't, that seems like it might be an input variable, but for quality control, the manager could in principle say, you know what, we need to better train our employees and get our service time down. And it may be impossible to do, but your job as the operations researcher might be to say, if you could get your mean service time down to one minute, from 1.1 minutes, it would improve your productivity by this much. It would make you this much money. And then somebody on the business side of things could then calculate if it's worth the amount of training to get people down to that 1.0 exactly. And then, uh, you know, how many lines? So how many tellers, how many lines? So you can imagine these are all things that could change that would change the performance of this. And then we measure things on the output. So we've got the how, you know, how busy the tellers are, what's the average delay of each customer, how long are the queues. And so those are all the output variables. So that was step one. This kind of looks like a bank. It passes face validity. It doesn't have all the details there. We're not kind of looking for details. It's like, yeah, I can see that that's a bank. Step two, input modeling. So I go out, I collect data. We already know how to do this. You'll be practicing that this week. And you're going to verify that the parameters you've chosen for your input models match the real world. So that's our first step in validity. We validated that our inputs are so then the next step is we take outputs from the simulation and we compare them to outputs from the real world. And that's something that we'll see uh, not only here, but in lab nine. Um, and so this is the more, this is really what I kind of associated with the guts of validation. So how do we do that? And so let's gather real system data. And uh, you might, you know, just as a reminder, might ensure that all data is collected from one particular time at the bank so that you don't get like this weird heterogeneity in service times and all that stuff. Maybe it's always at 9 a.m. at the bank. And then after I've taken all of these real uh, data, I might estimate 
that the average value, the, the mean average delay, so average delay, you know, this is average over customers, but average over many days at the bank maybe is about 4.3 minutes. So we expect that if this is a good model, then our simulation model will also produce an average delay of 4.3 minutes. And that's what we need to test. And so our null hypothesis is the null that is what we want actually is that the mean of our simulation is equal to the mean of the real world. The mean of the real world we know, we measured it, it's 4.3, and this here we get out of the sim. And so uh, the, this is me just sort of saying that in words. So we decide to take six replications of our simulation and compare the six outputs to this one number to see if it's plausible that our sim is meeting this performance criteria. Now, why six? You know, when would more or less be needed? So again, this is where that statistical power comes into play. If there's a lot of variance in this output here, this Y2 output, I might need to run this 600 times. But if it's pretty consistent that, you know, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's four, then maybe six is enough. Question? Well, I guess what I'm saying is that so that, that this, we're assuming that the real world uh, one, that we're, we're sort of building a model of something that's already built in the real world, and we might then want to then alter the model, but before we can alter the model, we have to make sure it matches the real world. And so, I'm, so I guess from the real world, you already have a, a whole bunch of data, so much data that I'm pretty confident that this is like 4.3 minutes plus or minus 0.1 minutes. So I'm kind of saying that I, I'm sort of taking it for granted that I can trust this 4.3 minute average. So just assume that I can go out to the real world and get a good fix on that. And now the question is, can I build a model that represents the real world and then make changes to that model that then suggest changes that I could then later make in the real world? So uh, Y6, that's where this power analysis comes into play, but we won't get into that until the second example that's more like the homework. And then um, for each replication, we go out and we, uh, we get a real world. So, for the, we, we, so we also measure the inputs. And the weird thing is, why would I measure the inputs? Because I've already done my input modeling. But for verification, I want to make sure that my arrivals are coming as expected and my service times are coming as expected. And then for validation, I'm measuring the actual delay. So I've got. I'm sort of measuring three things, two for verification and two for validation. So that gives me a table like this. And these two columns I'm not going to focus on here, but the idea here is these are my arrivals per hour out of the sim, and I should be able to verify if I, uh, you know, what's the best Poisson, does this look like a Poisson distribution, and does it have the rate that I expected? I have a service time here. Does this service time look like my expected service time distribution? If either of these two don't, then I don't even move on because there's a bug in my code and I need to fix that. Once these two have passed those checks, then I go on and I look at the output here, and then my question is, do these six data look like uh, something that could be drawn from a population with a mean of 4.3? And so this sounds like a t-test. And so you know, we, that's where we employ the t-test. So the, the, the history of the t-test is that uh, there was a guy named William Seeley Dawson who worked at Guinness Brewery, and they, um, they, the statistics of the time were such that you could only make inferences off of very, very large numbers of samples. But they wanted to be able to improve the quality of their beer without having to make a whole lot of batches or do a whole lot of taste tests. They said, wouldn't it be great if we could make inferences with only six tasters or only a few batches? or so on and so forth. And so what Gossett did is he actually went to people in, uh, in biology, people like Pearson, and, uh, and said, you know, could we develop a whole new framework of small sample statistics? And Gossett came up with this t-test. Now, when he came back to Guinness, Guinness said, this is great. It's really improving uh, the way we do things at the factory. We would support you publishing this so that other people could use it. But we have a policy that you cannot publish under your own name. So that's why he published under the name Student 
So when we talk about the student's t-test, it's not because it's something we only make you use, and then afterwards you'll have, it's not like, you know, like AP computer science, and you're like using a, an API that you'll never use again, but it's like customized for AP. It's like, it's actually just, it's named the student's t-test, and it's a real test that we use, and he just picked the name student because he needed a pen name. But uh, now we all know his real name was William Seeley Gotham. And so the t-test is basically this expression right here. And so if we refer to this as a one sample t-test. The hypothesis here is, uh, so our hypothesis is that the expected value of the sim is going to equal the expected value of the real world. So we're going to put our real world mean in here. And then these are going to be our simulated mean here. And so that is the one sample. So we refer to this as a one sample t-test because we're going to aggregate all of our data from our sim into one number, a sample mean, and that's where the one sample comes from. If there was a mean on the other side here, so that this was the mean from the real world, like the sample mean, this would be a two sample t-test. So it's a one sample t-test because the data only shows up once in that one bar there. And so we need to make sure that our data are independent and drawn from a normal distribution. And if they are, then this will end up um, being able to test whether the, their, your mean is, uh, is significantly different from the expected mean of 4.3. So I just want to highlight here this, um, I thought I had this Y down here, but is that in order to use this, you have to make sure your data are independent and normally distributed. Now we have tests for those things. Now usually independent here you can handle by saying, look, the design of my experiment is such that there is no way that one of my outputs for my simulation could have any relationship to another output. So you usually don't have to do like an autocorrelation test. But I've told you about the Shapiro-Wilk test. So really, I'm not going to hold you to it in this class. But if you ever do a t-test in real life, then at least I will sleep better at night knowing that I have insisted that you must use a Shapiro-Wilk before you use a t-test. Or you at least have to do a QQ plot to verify that the data that went into this t-test are normally distributed. If they're not, you cannot apply a t-test. You have to apply a u-test, which we'll talk about on Thursday. So, uh, the, so but that's, that's, these assumptions matter, and we have ways to test those assumptions. So a two-sided t-test, Nobody uses a one-sided t-test. It's usually bad stats. There's only a handful of times when you can ever justify using a one-sided t-test. And so a two-sided t-test tests for things that vary on both sides of the mean by as much deviation as you see in the data. And so we can look up critical values for that. So all you do for this is you end up calculating, I've got my data points, and I can end up calculating a mean for that output, 2.51. I can calculate a sample standard deviation of 0.82, and then I can run that into my t statistic, and I end up getting a statistic of about minus five. And so then the question is, uh, you know, how does this compare to my critical value? So I look into my, my table, and in the back of the book, notice that I use a, a degree of freedom equal to one less than the number of samples. And that, again, that's whenever you end up estimating parameters, you effectively lose a data point. And, uh, and that's why we only have five degrees of freedom. And also notice that my alpha has been cut in half, and that's because I've used a two-sample t-test. So my critical value I compare to is, is actually much less than the absolute value of this. And so I conclude that we reject the hypothesis, and this is a bad simulation model. This model needs calibrated. It needs to be fixed. And so the question is, how do we fix it? Well, we say, what could go, have gone wrong? Well, for one, we said, well, when a car is waiting behind another, there is no delay between one service ending and the next beginning. We made that assumption. And we thought, maybe that's where the problem is. Maybe these extra delays were adding up. But it turns out that if we gathered more data and found out this assumption is justified, it doesn't make much of a difference. So what's the problem? Well, what we actually, uh, the assumption that we made here, when a car arrives to the window that's immediately available, the teller begins service immediately. When we looked back at the bank, we find out that this actually is incorrect. People show up to the window and they have to wait. And why do they have to wait? 
It's because the teller is handling walk-in customers, and because I modeled the bank as a black box, I had no idea that these walk-in customers were having any effect on what was going on at the windows. So I now need to go back into my model and actually add walk-in customers. Even though I only care about the drive-through, I cannot separate the effect of the walk-in customers from the drive-through customers, and so I have to model that. So I'm going to go in and grab arrival and service time data on the walk-in customers and then rebuild my model. And then we'll test that. Now, are there any questions about that? Does that make sense? Is that I ended up showing that I built a simplistic model. The data looked way different than the real data. So then I ended up finding that I was missing something, and I added that back in. All right, so now I've got new data. Again, I collected input data from my SIM to verify that it was working. That's verification. Check that that's working, no bugs in the code. And now I have output data from my modified simulation. And I can do a new t-test, and I end up finding that this is far less than my critical value. So now I can say, do not reject the hypothesis. But the question is, what can I actually conclude about my SIM? Nothing yet, because I don't know what the statistical power is. I don't know how if I'm if actually if I've got any license to accept this hypothesis. P-values are not by themselves goodness of fit indicators. Just because I couldn't reject it doesn't mean I can accept it. And so that's what I need to be able to do a power analysis. And so remember, you know, this true positive rate. So we're going to do a sort of power analysis with this. And the way we do that is we have to calculate what we call an effect size. And so the effect size is just whatever <coughs> mean, so the effect size is sort of the, 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 you have to ask, how much of a difference do I want to see from my hypothetical distribution? And so I can say that my current mean is whatever the current mean is, like 4, and my actual mean is 4.6. So there is an effect of 0.6 divided by the standard deviation, and that is my effect size. And so one question I can ask is, for this effect size, how much power do I have? For the difference that I see, how likely is it that I am going to make a true positive uh, decision? And this operating characteristic curve that I'm about to show you will end up uh, showing me exactly that. But what's going to be what's more common is that ahead of time, people say not this question, but I want to detect this particular effect size. How many samples do I need to be able to detect it? And that's what you're going to end up doing in your homework, where it'll say you need to detect something that is at, you know, no smaller than, or that and, and is at least as big as a particular threshold. And then that threshold will go in here, you divide it by the standard deviation, and you get your effect size. Then you go to these operating characteristic curves in the back of the book, and these curves just plot the effect size on one axis versus the statistical power, or 1 minus beta, on the other axis. And every line corresponds to a different number of samples. And the two different ones correspond to two different alphas. So this is the alpha for 0.05, and this is the alpha for 0.01. If I zoom in on the alpha for 0.05, then what this tells me is that for a particular effect so let's say I saw an effect size of 1, one standard deviation. If I had 10 samples, then that means I have a 20% chance uh, of statistical power. I have a 20% statistical power. I have a 20% probability of accepting the null hypothesis. Now, uh, if I got one and more samples, like I went to 20 here, then I've got a almost no chance here. So this shows that as you increase the amount of data you get, you end up um, reducing the probability of accepting the null. So, uh, so, the, so the idea here is that what you're going to do in your homework is you're going to calculate a delta, and, you're then, it, and it's going to specify a desired statistical power. And then with that desired statistical power, you're going to combine that with the operating characteristic curve to determine how many samples you need in order to detect the effect size that they've asked you to detect. So that should hopefully become more clear on that question in the homework. So I tell you how much I want you to detect, how small, how sensitive things are, and uh, I tell you what alpha I want, 
and then um, you end up calculating the effect size, and then you end up calculating the number of samples according to that statistical power. So the other thing that you'll end up doing, and then so in reality, we don't look in the back of the book anymore. We call up in MATLAB something like stamp size power, which does this for us, or in R, power, which does this for us. And you basically give these the statistical test you're looking for, a t test, a chi-squared, et cetera, the variance, and it'll figure out whatever else you need. So we have these solutions, but for now, you've got to do this in the back of the book to do it manually to become comfortable with it. Now the other thing that that question is going to do is sort of a direct comparison of output to input data, as opposed to this mean versus, uh, versus the simulated data. So imagine if I had a bunch of data from the output uh, in a real system and a bunch of data from the simulated system. I could ask a human to look at those and say, do these things look like they could have been generated by the same system? And if a human can't tell the difference, that's a real validation that my simulated model produced realistic output. Now, without a, a human, I could have used a two-sample t-test, where I put in the raw data from the real system and the raw data from the output system and compare them together. And we can do that, but uh, its uh, statistical power is a little more complicated to calculate, and it kind of leaves out something that I'm pretty sure the human would ask for. A human would might ask me, all right, what input data did you use to generate these outputs? I'm only going to evaluate whether these outputs are realistic if I know what inputs went into your system. Because, you know, it just seeing raw outputs doesn't really, it's, it's not helpful. But when I see that, oh, you weren't busy at this time, and yet you got a really long delay, well, that's not really realistic. So how do I manage to get an automated mechanism like a two-sample t-test that also uses that input data? And that reminds us of that muffin baking simulation. And so that is the other half of that homework assignment is that you're going to generate, a, use a paired t-test in a way that actually makes it simpler to do this test where you combine real data from a real system, real data from a simulation system, and real input data all together to get a much better understanding of how valid your system is. So the idea is that if I take real input data, like real numbers of customers who've arrived, real delays between customers, et cetera, and I run them into both the real system, in other words, I just take the output data from the real system, and then I run that real input data, not simulated random numbers, into the simulated system. I now can generate paired outputs. For these inputs, I got these two outputs. For these inputs, I got these two outputs. And I can take the difference between those two and then just subtract those and then use a one sample t-test to see if the difference is different than zero. And I'll show a, a concrete example of this in just the next slide. And so this is an example of what we refer to as a paired difference t-test, and it uses statistical blocking, where we create blocks of, out of the, our comparison groups, and those blocks reduce the variance, and by reducing variance, they increase statistical power. So our example here is we have an input data set, like the arrivals on Monday, the arrivals on Tuesday, the arrivals on Thursday or Wednesday, and so on. These are real data from the real system, and these are real output data from the real system, and we run these, these inputs into our sim, and we get outputs so that across these rows here, this output is paired to this output. And because those are paired, I can just take their differences, like I do in this column right here. And now the question is, does this column of data differ significantly from zero? If it does, then I can say that my simulation's broken. If it doesn't, I can run a power analysis, and if the power analysis comes out with high enough power, I can conclude I've got a good simulation. So I just calculate all these differences, I get the average difference, I get the standard deviation of the difference, and then I do a one sample t-test with a hypothesis of zero, which gives me this simple statistic here. And this will be, again, you're going to combine this with a power analysis on your homework. So remember how to do this. And then from here, um, you know, it's just t-test stuff. And so question two just combines this with a power analysis that we previously did. And if you come up with a high enough power, you can conclude that your simulation is valid, and then you can start doing interesting operational work. All right, so, um, so that was a little fast. In these last couple of slides, are there any questions? 
All right, so in that case, uh, for your, this is question three in your attendance uh, exercise for today. And the question I guess I'll ask is, um, what is the formula that relates statistical power to beta? So what is the relationship between beta and statistical power? Beta is the type two error rate, and statistical power is this like true positive rate. And so what's the formula? If you were to write a formula, statistical power, in terms of beta, what would that formula be? So is it just beta? Is it beta squared? Is it the square root of beta? Is it beta times five? I still have problem. You said, uh, one second, let me just go ahead and stop here. 